Sharma to chair this session. Professor Sharma is a faculty in strategic management group in IM Calcutta. So, Thank you and good afternoon everybody. So, my job will be to introduce Dr. Indrajit Banerjee. He is the Director of Knowledge Society's Division, Communication and Information Sector of UNESCO. He is an internationally recognized media and communication scholar and has edited 10 books, published articles in some of top international journals in the field of communication. He has also presented papers at over 50 international conferences around the world. Since January 2004, Dr. Banerjee was the Secretary General of the Asian Media, Information and Communication Center in Singapore until his appointment as Chief of Section ICT in Education, Science and Culture at the Communication Information Center of UNESCO. So Dr. Banerjee, welcome to Ayn Calcutta and the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the very generous introduction, Professor. Uh, let me begin by uh, thanking Professor Somprakash Gondopadhyay and the Indian Institute of Management for the very kind invitation. I would just like to say that I'm uh, honored by this opportunity to share my thoughts and views and I think as some of you may imagine, a speech from the United Nations after lunch and be an extremely good lullaby and sleep and I hope that was my case. Let me begin by quoting the very famous and well-known United Nations Secretary General Jack Hammarskjöld, who once had famously said, the United Nations was not created to take you to heaven, but to prevent you from going to hell. And I think uh, to a certain extent, uh, when we talk about ICDs and the internet, uh, the same rule applies. There's greater and greater concern uh, over the last few years, especially, uh, as to why the internet, which has so much a promise, is now become, for example, uh, a site for cyberbullying, hate speech, rampant breach of privacy, uh, data theft, and radicalization of young people, and so on. So while the internet has been uh, undoubtedly powerful means of communication the world has seen. It's got 3.5 million people online. It also seems to be increasing the remaining problems that need to be dealt with. So let me by, uh, begin by saying that uh, the Knowledge Society Division of UNESCO, well, you will be wondering why it's the Knowledge Society Division, because even to today, the more prevalent term is Information Society. And this, the reason for this was the first World Summit of Information Society, which was held in Geneva in 2003, and the second summit, which was held in Tunis in 2005. And at that time, uh, UNESCO was quite troubled with the old notion of the Information Society. Uh, what does that mean? Is it just the pursuit of information, access to information? Or are there much more important questions which I believe? That's the knowledge that you're looking at. Knowledge is a leverage to overcome obstacles to growth, obstacles to opportunity, obstacles to access to education, employment, livelihoods, and so on. So in 2005, we published the first world report on knowledge societies. And our knowledge societies concept, just to set the framework for my presentation today, is based on four pillars. And you will understand why they're all relevant. The first is universal access to information and knowledge. Second is quality education for all. Third is freedom of expression. And last but not least, linguistic and cultural diversity. We heard also in the morning several references made to the whole concept of access. Now let me be a little critical of this whole concept of access. For far too long and even today, the prevalent notion affiliated to the concept of access seems to be connected. Plug everybody in and the world would be a better place. And that's not the case at all. As you can see, the more people are getting plugged in, the more we seem to be having problems. On access has to be defined in a much larger sense than just mere connectivity. Access has to be all about uh, the capacity to transform information into knowledge, uh, the capacity to access quality education, 
uh, access to multilingual content. And this again, I don't know how many of you are aware, that a recent report uh, showed that there are about 6,500 languages on the internet, out of which about 400 are online only, out of which English and Chinese account for 52% of the content. So when we talk about access, uh, when you know that most of the country's languages are not present on the internet, what would people go and do online? And even more funny, recently our study said that many million people who actually have connectivity have a go online. And that should make us think. Why, if you have access to the internet, why would you go online? Obviously because, this is what I was talking to, uh, I was uh, with Dr. Sean Prakash yesterday and his team, that there is a lot of work to be done even in terms of the whole notion of access to education through all these wonderful tools. And uh, as long and, uh, until access is related to the concept of value, what is it bringing me? Is it improving my livelihoods? Is it making my life better? Am I communicating better with my friends and my family? The whole concept of access actually is quite meaningless. So I think that is the first uh, point I'll make in my presentation before I switch really to more United Nations uh, concerns because I think uh, that is the why of this debate today. Uh, we have talked about the how already this morning. Maybe we're going a little bit on reverse mode, <coughs> but why is the question. And it is particularly timely that we speak today on the issue of source innovation to promote digital aid learning to underserved children as well as other marginalized sections of society. As it is only a few months ago, at the 70th session of the United Nations General Assembly in September 2015, adopted a new global development agenda entitled Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I would strongly recommend all of you, if you are not familiar with this framework, because it is going to be guiding all the world's development strategies and approaches until 2030. So we are stuck in this until 2030. So, on, of this agenda, one of the most important goals is goal number four, is called SDG4, which, is foc which focuses on education, and particularly calls for ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all, with its key pillars of access, <coughs> equity, and inclusion. Now, this puts a little more perspective on why we are talking about ICTs, because we believe, obviously, and I think uh, Dr. Kumar made a very good presentation to show, show us how ICTs should not be seen as a panacea for all development challenges, but that at the same time, it properly harnessed and strategically leveraged, it affects every single aspect of the process of education. So this is crucial. And I would argue, to extend this point further, that ICTs, when again properly harnessed, channelized, can have a significant impact on these three key pillars. Number one, access. Understandable. You have access to so much of educational resources, content, uh, quality materials, etc. Equity, because the barriers to entry are much lower. Several presentations highlighted that. And inclusion. I shall come to that later. So the Education 2030 agenda of the United Nations reaffirms a political commitment to establish legal and policy frameworks that promote inter alia coordinated partnerships at all levels to uphold the right to participation of all stakeholders. And that's why I'm particularly happy that uh, all the stakeholders are represented here. It also entrusts UNESCO to lead and contribute as well as coordinate the 2030 education agenda by undertaking advocacy to sustain political commitment facilitating policy dialogue, <coughs> policy sharing, and standard setting. So we can break, of course, all of these down. I won't have enough time but to see how these become central goals and objectives in order to make more uh, education more accessible and of higher quality. Now let's look at the state of the world, because this is why I said the why is an important question. Now we can come to it later. <laughs> As stated in the recently launched 2016 Global Monitoring Report by UNESCO, the goals of 
SDG4 are formidable <coughs> and require us to rethink the parameters of education worldwide. According to Commission research for the 2016 UNESCO Global Monitoring Report, for 90% of industrialized countries and for every single country in Southern Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, even expanding their education systems at the fastest rates ever observed in the regions would be too slow to meet the first target in the global goal on education. Even 90% at the fastest ever rates in terms of acceleration of access to education. It would be almost the 22nd century before we truly achieve SDG4 worldwide. We are talking 2030 and now we are jumping to the 22nd century. According to current trends, the universal primary completion will be achieved in 2042. Universal lower secondary completion in 2059 and universal upper secondary completion in 2084. You can see how far away we are from our goals. Rich countries are themselves not on course. Even at the fastest rate of progress ever seen in the region, one in ten countries in Europe and North America will still not achieve universal primary upper secondary completion by 2030. Not even Europe and North America. This report, however, points out that if the world community found solutions to overcome the current challenges to education and achieve SDG4 goals, the returns would improve the quality of life on this planet for the world's citizens, and in particular, those that are the most vulnerable and disadvantaged today. The benefits of this would be good for the entire planet. For example, universal, universalizing upper secondary completion for women in sub-Saharan Africa by 2030 would result in 300,000 to 350,000 fewer child deaths per year by 2050. In lower income countries, universalizing upper secondary completion by 2030 would increase per capita income by 75% by 2050 and bring poverty elimination forward by 10 years. Universal upper secondary completion by 2030 would prevent up to 50,000 disaster related deaths per decade by 2050, 40 or 2050. A key message therefore, and this is why I call it the why. This is why we are here. This is why we are talking about the importance of education. This is why we are talking about the critical nature of inclusion. And this is therefore why we see in ICTs a potential tool to expand access to quality education. So let's let be very clear why we are here. So a key message coming from these findings is clear. For education to be transformative, in support of the new sustainable development agenda, education as usual will not suffice. From a systems perspective, action need, needed to meet SDG 4 targets include collaboration across sectors. This means collaboration between ministries, civil society, the private sector, and both at the local and national levels. Secondly, Using education as a capacity building tool in all sectors is <coughs> fundamental. This means investing in integrated interventions that could have multiplier effects for several development outcomes. Thirdly, recognizing that education cannot fight inequality on its own, labor markets and governments must not excessively penalize lower income individuals. Cross sectoral cooperation can reduce barriers for vulnerable and marginalized groups. Lastly, education funding needs to be both adequate and predictable to ensure the provision of good quality education, especially to vulnerable and marginalized groups. UNESCO has undertaken a, a series of initiatives in the field of ICTs in education. I won't go into details. I can give you the access to the websites. But one of the things which uh, we started very early up was the what is called the ICT competency framework for teachers. Now, when we embarked on our ICT and education programs, we realized that one of the challenges was that the teachers themselves did not have adequate competency to harness or leverage ICTs. Therefore, together with several partners, including Microsoft, Cisco, Intel, and others, we developed this competency framework for teachers, which is now widely used around the world to both assess the level of knowledge of teachers and competencies of teachers, but at the same time, provide them with the curricula to upgrade their skills. 
So this tool serves as an invaluable framework for structuring objectives of professional development, both in service and pre-service. It provides a means for our member states to set standards and objectives for teacher training based on national ICD education integration objectives. We have worked closely with ministries of education worldwide to develop training programs based on openly licensed educational materials and in OER form. Now, to come to open education resources, we you know as OERs. They are also taking the world by storm. Several people, including uh, Professor Vijay Kumar, mentioned this this morning. Uh, open education resources are any education resource materials that may be freely accessed, reused, modified, and shared. It is openly available for use without paying royalties or license fees. So that is the classic definition of open education resources. If you may go to UNESCO's uh, website, you will see we published along with the Commonwealth of Learning Open Education Resource Policy Guidelines, which again have been adopted by many countries around the world. Next year we'll be organizing the second World Open Education Resources Congress. All of you are welcome. It will happen in September 2017 in Slovenia. It's a beautiful country also, so I invite you to come and attend again. <coughs> the last point I'll touch on is uh, among our key programs in ICD education because the word inclusion uh, is perhaps the most critical in the whole title that you see. And today, uh, for those of you who are not aware, there are about 1 billion people who suffer from some form of disability. That means one out of seven people in this world. And these people with disabilities face many challenges, including discrimination, social exclusion, illiteracy, unemployment, poverty, and limited access to information, education, healthcare, and employment. And it is very evident, and this has been around, seen around the world, Whenever the most marginalized and excluded people have been provided access to education, there has been a severe and significant increase in terms of livelihoods, in terms of capabilities, in terms of economic growth, and so on. So ICT, of course, can play a crucial role with all the gadgets you have, mobile phones, all the technologies you have, uh, in improving the lives of persons with disabilities. And we are concentrating at UNESCO a lot on how we can enhance access to education for persons with disabilities because other than without that they have no chance in life. Just for for example, uh, only two percent of children with disabilities actually come to private education. Just to give you an idea, two percent. So they they have absolutely no opportunity, they're totally excluded and marginalized. So in the field of education our focus again here in terms of our inclusive approach is to see how do we foster, create, design, innovate, so that we have policies in place, we have opportunities in place, we have learning resources in place. A lot of people talk about resources. I wanted to ask Dr. Kumar and many others in the room, what amount of this content is accessible to these people? I would love to have an answer to that. I can guarantee you, news won't be very positive. I even had a very interesting conversation with people and I himself. And uh, who I, to my surprise, we talk so much about open and distance learning. To my surprise, we just did a research to find out that a large majority of open and distance learning courses are not accessible to digital people. And one would think, common sense, would tell you that it is the disabled people who have problems of mobility, problems of being blind, not being able to read the regular books, etc. Who would benefit or who should benefit the most from open and distance learning? But yet, if all your contents, all your websites, all your resources, all your iLabs uh, are not accessible to these other people, I think it's a serious, serious issue and let's not even talk about inclusion then. I could go on for a long time, but I think many of you before me, including Professor Kumar, we my time. So I'm very happy to respond to questions. But this basically is our argument. Statistics are very clear. For those who are interested, please go and read the Global Monitoring Report of UNESCO 2016. They'll show you across the world the statistics. They show you by age group, by gender, 
And that is the why we're talking about, that we need to look at all possible solutions, including information communication technologies, to expand access to quality education. Thank you very much. Questions and observations, please.